and Mid-Atlantic Regional Sales Manager. Um, Gremlin is actually a company that was founded by two pioneers in chaos engineering that came out of Amazon and Netflix and were imminently in, or, or majorly involved in the development of a lot of the technologies that created chaos engineering. And what they f figured out was that there was a need out there for companies to have access to an enterprise class chaos engineering as a service platform. And so we have, uh, as a company, created that uh, and are now making that available to all of our uh, customers and uh, hopefully future customers. So uh, we appreciate you coming on today. And if you'd like to learn more, you can go to gremlin.com. Uh, we also host the Chaos Engineering Slack, which is an open platform with over 5,000 site reliability engineers and other engineers uh, there where you can get a lot of resources and information. Once again, thanks for joining. Fantastic. Thanks, Kelly. Well, like I said, we have two uh, awesome engineers here today to uh, talk you through the world of Chaos Engineering. Uh, should be a great talk. Uh, our first is Jacob Pleak. He's a solutions architect at Gremlin. Uh, where he works on chaos engineering, which is the facilitation of controlled experiments to identify systematic uh, weaknesses or systemic, excuse me. Uh, Jacob's worked on chaos engineering across a, a variety of industries, including finance, e-commerce, airlines, retail, and insurance. And he's the host, uh, host of uh, Break Things on Purpose, which is a podcast dedicated to sharing chaos engineering experiences. Uh, Jacob pre previously worked at Fonatics as a senior C SRE where he was responsible for providing a reliable e-commerce experience to process over 1,100 orders a minute and has in-depth experience providing reliable service on peak days such as Cyber Monday and Black Friday in the retail world. Uh, Finnegan Hugh is our uh, site rel reliability engineer at Terrazzo. Uh, he enjoys looking for the unknown unknowns, which is something we're going to talk about a little bit more in this, uh, in this talk today, uh, and how he can, they can better help him provide resilient and reliable systems for customers. So Finn and Jacob, want to go ahead and pass things over to you uh, to kick things off for us today. All right, awesome. So let's get it started. So the topic we're going to present today is chaos engineering and observability. And but I, before going to the topic, I would like to tell a story about exploring the unknowns. So um, I myself have always dreamed about, you know, going into dark outer space and visit other planets and you know, just to see what's that like. And I believe a lot of you in the audience also do. And so does this guy named Elon Musk, the founder of SpaceX. And he has this overarching goal that someday people are able to, we can send people to Mars. And even eventually people are able to live there. But of course it's not that easy. So before we can send people to Mars, Elon Musk envisioned that we should be able to send people to the moon again. But um, even before that, we should be at least be able to send people to space. And uh, on May 30th, space first Crew Dragon was able to send two astronauts into the space station. And here's a quote from Elon Musk that I really like, which says that failure is an option here, which is referring to SpaceX. If things are not failing, you are not innovating enough. So of course, SpaceX is all about innovation, from sending people to the space, to the moon, and to their ultimate goal of sending people to the Mars. They have been pushing for the limit step by step. And my question I have here is, is SpaceX failing? And so from these pictures of those rockets blowing up, we can say definitely that SpaceX has been failing. But we also need to realize two things. The first one is that a lot of those failures are not unexpected. There are actually experiments conducted with intended failures. And the second thing is that a lot of those rockets can be extremely uh, expensive and they could cost up to millions of dollars. So why are they, why is SpaceX conducting those cost experiments with expected failures? And I believe the answer to that question lies within the core thing that they care most about, which is the people. If we can't guarantee the people we're sending to space can arrive or return safely, then none of the rest really matters. So they're um, conducting those expensive experiments, creating those failures in order to mitigate any possible risks that can be involved in those missions. 
And so that's the SpaceX side of the story. But for us, as people in the IT industry, as tech companies, we're also exploring and innovating. And we explore and innovate by bringing out new ideas and pushing out new features. And I would say that the thing that we care most about is the experience of our customers. Because if we can't guarantee that our customers would have a good experience with our products, then it doesn't really matter that much uh, what new fancy features we put out. So I believe that similar to SpaceX, we could also incorporate failures as part of our path to build a more reliable product. And that brings us to the topic of today, which is combining the power of chaos engineering and observability to build a more resilient system. And so Jacob will take him there to talk about chaos engineering. And after that, I'll go over the concept of observability. In the end, we'll do a live demonstration of how we can um, get insight into our system by creating failures using chaos engineering and observability tools. Awesome, thanks Finn. So, um, so let's start by defining simply what chaos engineering is. It's a term that is um, thrown around a lot and you know, many folks don't know where it comes from um, but, or even what it is. So chaos engineering is applying stress to systems to test how they respond. Uh, so this allows us to reflect the real world scenarios that are unpredictable for traditional testing to make sure that our people, our applications, infrastructure, and network are designed for reliability and prepared for failures before they happen. So in this way, we can patch bugs, fix configurations, or find faults in our incident response procedures before they ever reach our customers. So it's easy to see the ramifications of how brittle this new and rapid innovation in digital world that we're in can be, um, especially with social media bringing headline news of big failures to the forefront nearly every day, whether that's regular e-commerce failures on Black Friday, uh, breakdowns at banks and financial institutions, um, and in the worst cases, life-threatening incidents on airlines, um, the cost of major technological breakdowns goes far beyond just the billions lost in company revenue. And some of these pieces of the infrastructure uh, that we rely on aren't even in our control, but the, the Frankness, the, frankly, our customers don't care. If your site's down, they don't care why, they just know that they're unsatisfied with their experience with you. So mobile and web access, uh, web app access, I should say, is easier than ever now. So we have more transactions and business uh, is performed online than ever before. So network speeds are now constantly increasing, which means that users are getting more demanding. So we're constantly looking for ways to satisfy that demand quickly and cost effectively. That may mean breaking up monolithic systems for performance reasons, more distributed systems for ease of management, and the promise of reduced infrastructure costs, um, as well as the need for tracking all of these, these services wherever they are. So with, of course, with more complexity comes more risk that things will break. So as things are only getting more complex, um, this makes things more difficult to operate. So there's a pressure for faster, for, for faster, innovation, um, faster innovation, and that's driving the adoption of new types of infrastructure, application architectures, and development processes. So that's where we have cloud, microservices, and DevOps to um, help us improve our ability to release new code faster, but this comes at the expense of operational complexity. So as you increase velocity, the quality of your code with each release will at best stay the same, but more than likely decline, meaning that the number of failures you experience will increase. So in order to prevent the number of failures increasing with the velocity of our releases, we need to do something different. Decreasing our failure rate also has the benefit of freeing up time from fighting fires to spend on innovation. So with dependencies on networks that we don't own, infrastructure that we don't control, um, in some cases, orchestrators that are black boxes, open source or legacy dependencies that have unknowns, and people who can be unreliable, testing the code of our application will never uncover all the errors. So even in Amazon, um, the human error actually ended up being the reason why the uh, S3 US East 1 region went down uh, back in 2017. Um, and I remember that day very well because I was on call and uh, as things tended to go uh, a, little, a, little, uh, a little crazy that day. So all in all, we need a new way to test the other parts of our application stack so that we're sure that we've configured everything right and that all of our processes are in place. 
So chaos engineering involves controlled experiments. So prior to conducting testing, users create hypotheses focusing on a single service and then test that service. Then bugs are identified and then fixed and then the blast radius is expanded. So in this way, issues are isolated to a single service so that a team can focus on repairing. Uh, meanwhile, enterprises can feel safe experimenting because of the limited blast radius of the experiment. So chaos engineering brings two very crucial benefits. So first, we can proactively identify and fix bugs that could produce an outage, rather than waiting for a system failure to show us where the weakness is and then react. Um, and then secondly, by running proactive chaos engineering game days, um, our engineers grow more familiar with system behavior, which makes them more effective during an incident. Not to mention, this also helps us tune our monitoring and detection systems so that we, de we detect issues earlier. So what successful, what successful innovative companies have realized is that the move towards optimal reliability and then giving control back to their engineers, but we need to create a culture of proactively testing for failure and doing this constantly is the answer. So there are companies who rely on their customer facing web applications to generate revenue and customer satisfaction from Netflix and Amazon, for example, to many other globally recognized brands in e-commerce, financial services, uh, media, streaming, gaming, every industry that you can think of. Uh, so all of them are embracing the concept uh, of chaos engineering. And they're doing it not to just inject chaos into their environments, but to actually remove the likelihood of chaos in those environments. So rejecting failure into our systems, it lets us see us how they'll react and what side effects that uh, they will have in a large disaster scenario. So that way we can prevent them from ever occurring. So uh, at a company's best day, the launch of a new product, or Black Friday, or maybe there's a new streaming series, that will be their best day and not their worst. And then the result is higher customer and employee satisfaction, and then an increased focus on innovation um, instead of fighting fires. So with chaos engineering, you can feel confident in your configurations as you adopt new technology like the cloud or Kubernetes, and you can perform game days to train your teams to respond faster to failures. So you can also ensure that your monitoring is tuned correctly to catch those real world scenarios. And, uh, and this is a really big one for a lot of companies, you can map your applications dependencies on databases, SAS, legacy code, um, and test out those disaster response tools and processes and make sure that they actually work as planned. So, uh, so how does that then tie into observability, Finn? Okay, awesome, so thanks, Jacob. Um, so from Jacob's top, we can definitely see the value of um, chaos engineering. And if we combine chaos engineering with observability, then we can really get a deep sense into the internal of our system. So as we're talking about observability, of course, the first thing we need to be clear of is what is observability? And uh, here's a um, definition from control theory, which says that uh, observability is the measure of how well internal states of system can be inferred from knowledge of its external outputs. And so here, internal states of a system can be considered as the health of the system, and the external outputs can be related to the three pillars of observability. It is a general conception that observability is formed with three pillars or components, which are metrics, logs, and traces. In another word, good, uh, well-designed observability platform is usually consisted of these three components. And they together should give us a pretty clear view of the, uh, the internal of our system. But of course, there are other types of data or information that can be also very valuable. So observability is definitely not limited to just these three components. And what observability really comes down to is about making educated guesses or hypotheses. As we're trying to fill out this, uh, these blanks in this hypothesis, we can go back and revisit the definition of observability. So what we really want to achieve with observability is to be able to gain insight into the internal behavior of our system from external outputs. And so, so that when there's a problem, we can quickly identify it and react to it. And so here, what, we really, what observability really provides us is the because or the rationale behind the internal behavior of our system. And the if would be the internal state of our system. The then would be the 
outcomes or, for example, any business impacts. But then uh, another question that follows is, as we're making those hypotheses, right, and as we're trying to explain them with observability, how do we know that we are making enough hypotheses so that we cover all the aspects of our system? And that brings us to the concept of the unknown unknowns. So it is usually divided into four different categories. And uh, to help you better understand this, I'll tie it back to the story of SpaceX. And the first case we have here is the unknown unknowns. Those are the things that we don't understand and we're not aware of. A case in point, for example, is sending people to Mars, right? Because we're not yet aware of a lot of the difficulties involved in that. And in those cases, we need to conduct research and experiments to be at least aware of the problems. And then we have the unknown knowns. Those are the things that we understand, but we're not aware of yet. Those can be also considered as intuitions. And after that, we have the known unknowns. Those are the problems that we are aware of, that we know is not going to work yet. For example, there was this problem with the parachutes developed for Crew Dragon uh, called asymmetric loading that caused the parachutes to fail in certain situations. And in those cases, we need to build out hypotheses, explain them, and fix them until they become, uh, until they work or become something we do understand. And finally, we have the known knowns. Those are the things that we're both aware of and understand, which should also be our final destination. So as we're building out softwares, we're always starting with a lot of unknown unknowns. And we want to convert all of them into known knowns. And I believe that the first step to achieve that is through exploration. There's a quote from Neil Tyson that says, break stuff more often. That's a consequence of exploration. Exploration is what you do when you don't know what you're doing. So this describes exactly the situation when we're facing the unknown models. And it also goes back to what Jacob was talking about. In the process of exploration, we break stuff to progressively test our system, isolate the problems, and use observability tools to provide the rationale behind the behavior of the system. And finally, uh, achieve our goal to mitigate the risks by bringing the unknown unknowns into normals. All right, so with that said, I believe we're ready to go into the demo part. So um, I want you guys to imagine that there's this service called Terrazzo Parcel Service. And there are companies that are selling different types of goods, for example, motorsports or e-sports supplies, et cetera. And um, so what Terrazzo Parcel Service does is basically that when a user requests goods from a company, it processes the request and schedule a truck to pick up the product from the company or the company's warehouse to deliver to the end user. In order to achieve that, the Rather Parcel Service always, also communicates with several third-party services with each um, controls the um, traffic from the terminal hub of that particular region. And let's also go over the architecture of the demo app, demo app and other services. So the demo app to Razo Parcel Service is, uh, has four separate services, front end, customer, driver, and route with each running in a single um, container. And then we also have three third-party services that sit along with the demo app, Northwest, Southwest, and Southeast. On the observability stack, we have Jaeger, which is a open source distributed tracing tool that we use to provide us insight into each individual request. And inside of our demo app, we defined customized business metrics that got sent into Prometheus server. And then we have Grafana that pulls those data from Prometheus server to provide us visualizations generated from those business metrics. And finally, of course, we have Gremlin Daemon running as a container that can talk to our demo app and initiate attacks on it. All right, so now we have a basic sense of what the demo app does and the architecture. Let's now imagine a scenario where the terminal hub of Northwest region is down. 
and the service is not able to connect to it. So as we're examining our system, we'll probably make the following hypothesis. So if the Northwest Terminal Hub connection goes down, then deliveries will not be impacted. And the reason is that the DevOps team told us the system will immediately recover and that we should trust our system to be resilient enough to withstand this kind of outage. But of course, we don't want to wait and actually see that uh, this happen in prod and see that it does have an impact on customers. So it's probably safer to admit that there are still some unknown unknowns there with our system. And the way to break through that is through a chaos experiment. And Jacob, would you like to talk about how to perform a chaos experiment? I'd love to. So there's essentially a few steps that you need to, uh, to perform a chaos experiment. So we've already talked through starting with a hypothesis. This is what we expect to happen um, if this incident takes place. And now we're going to essentially test that, that, uh, that hypothesis. So we want to define our blast radius. So how do we make sure that we're only targeting um, the Northwest hub, for example? And then what are we using to monitor um, the impact? So we touched on Jaeger, um, Prometheus, and Grafana already. So we've got that box checked. And, and then we'll touch on running the experiment here when we get to Gremlin in a minute. So, and we'll walk through that scenario. Um, and then lastly, based off of what, uh, what we conclude, we'll, we'll actually be able to share our, our um, experiment results, um, both with the team as well as the overall organization, as well as any next steps that come out of that. All right, so with that said, uh, let's actually go to the demo app and initiate the attack. Do we want to show the steady state of the application first? Yeah, of course. So um, here in Grafana, we um, so just as a, as a side note, um, before the presentation uh, presentation starts, I started Locust, which is a um, user load testing tool that we use to generate some traffic into the system. And now this is Grafana, and it's showing all the visualizations from the business metric we got from Prometheus. And here we also have the error rate by customer by pickup region, and also the geographic uh, visualization of those requests. All, All right. right. So yeah, so let's go ahead and take a look at our scenario. So we touched on, we're wanting to essentially look and see what, uh, invalidate the hypothesis that we have. So um, essentially we're going to test whether there will be customer impact um, if the connection to the Northwest terminal hub service is down. Um, and then our expectation is that this should be um, you know, recoverable um, on its own um, based off of whether that's redundancy or additional scaling um, and that it shouldn't impact our customers. And we'll essentially use that um, error rate dashboard that Finn uh, mentioned a little earlier to validate that. So go ahead, yeah, go ahead and open that up. And then this is essentially where our blast radius comes in. So we'll take a look at the attack um, and we're only targeting the Northwest service container. And then we're actually going to black hole traffic from hitting it. Now, we'll go ahead and run this for three minutes uh, so we can validate that, um, that impact. And, but we, all, we always have the ability to halt an experiment at any, at any point. So if there is impact from, um, that is way too high or it would affect um, our customers, break an SLO or SLA, something like that, that would be something we would consider um, doing. And then we can place our results as well as if it matched our hypothesis and, um, and how that incident was detected or mitigated to. Right, so now that the black hole um, attack is starting, let's go back to Grafana. And uh, there are two panels that I would like actually um, bring in attention here. The first one is this one, error rate by pickup region. And this one tells us the error rate of customer requests by each region in terms of all the requests. And below that, this graph also called uh, error rate by pickup region. That one gives us the um, error rate 
by customer request uh, on its own. And so now um, let's go back to the attack. Yeah, let's open that up really fast. And it tells us the attack has been running. Um, let me just refresh. Seems to be going up a little bit. But not too much. Hmm. Let me make sure that they're still generating traffic. Okay. Um, actually, let me um, restart Locust and uh live demos <laughs> <laughs> right. no yeah just give it a little time for the data to come in to the, the front of the dashboard for sure And the attack, we might have to restart the attack too because it's three minutes, but right. we still got another maybe a few seconds. But if not, no worries. And while he's getting that set up, I want to remind everybody to um, ask your questions here in a few minutes. We're going to have uh, our, our own uh, Randy Franklin uh, host a Q&A session right after the demo. So. Feel free to use the raise your hand feature or post it in chat right now and we'll call on you when we get there. I'm just going to restart the Docker Compose. Yeah, no worries. Do something. And while you're doing that, one thing that's cool is with a scenario is we have the, and we'll, we'll do this here in a second, we have the ability to restart it at any point, um, but we also have the, and this kind of ties into, um, you know, automation. And the question I get a lot um, is, okay, you know, I've run through um, an experiment, but you know, what's, what's next, right? Or if I validated that we're resilient to a particular failure mode, um, you know, should I automate that? And the answer, the short answer is yes. So you want to start to think about, you know, if I'm resilient to, if the service is resilient to, you know, CPU pressure, for example, and I validated that, okay, that's, that's today, right? But, you know, based off of the changes that I make, you know, to the code or a new feature that might not be that way a month from now, right? So, you know, let's bake these, you know, types of experiments into our CI CD pipelines um, is a really, really um, popular way to, uh, from a next step perspective after, let's say a, a game day. All right, cool. Thanks, uh, Jacob. And now that I've restarted the app, you know, sorry about that. And uh, it seems like the traffic are um, flowing in to the system. Uh, let me rerun the uh, scenario. All right. Um, let's just uh, give a little bit of time for the attack to start. Uh, yep. Let's see. Yeah, because it should be the same tag, so it should be good to go mm -hmm. there. So we'll give it a sec and see if I can find it. <clears throat> right. There we go. right now, it seems like the attack is running. Yes, indeed. Just uh, give it a little bit of time for the attack to take effect. Indeed. This is also like a key, a key point, and we'll touch on some use cases here in a minute uh, and when we hit back to the presentation. But, you know, understanding that, you know, what we, you know, in incident in real time and how does that tie into a monitoring and observability, you know, story is actually a really key, you know, part of this as well.
especially if Griffon is acting weird. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let me go to Prometheus server and see yeah. if those data are coming in correctly. For sure. So, and, and one of my favorite things is kind of like your mental model tends to shift when you start to do things like this. Um, a good example, and oh, looks like that's starting 100%, mm -hmm. so everything's failing, awesome. So, um, so it certainly probably matches our whole condition, right? But, you know, just asking the question, hey, like if there's latency between my application and my database, how do we handle that, right? Like what are, what's our retry or, or, or our timeout logic? Um, I was running a game day where everyone in the room actually had a different answer to this, which typically means that they hadn't really had the conversation before, which is pretty amazing. And so, and then the actual result coming out of that was, it wasn't, no one was right, but now, now they know. And what can you do with that new data point? Right. Um, all right, so sorry about that hiccup, but um, right now I think this uh, is uh, basically working. And right now we're seeing 100% error rate with Northwest series because we literally just um, started the attack right after we started the whole app. Right. And we also see that the error rate for the customer request to Northwest is at 100%, which means that all the customer requests to Northwest service has failed. And uh, given that, we can also go to Jaeger and uh, let me find the most recent uh, request to Northwest service. That one's good. All right, so for this particular request and in, in the customer trace, we see that we got an error, get truck error. And the error message tells us that the get request to Northwest service is returning a timeout, which means that our service was not able to connect to the Northwest service. So um, with that said, what we've seen from this um, experiment definitely contradicts with our initial hypothesis because we're seeing the uh, error logs as well as the increase in the error rate to Northwest uh, region service. And with, with that, we can make our result and our proposed result now is that if Northwest Terminal Hub connection goes down, then deliveries to Northwest customers will fail because there is a single point of failure and the recover process do not trigger. So uh, at this point, we've converted the once unknown unknown into known unknown. And from that, we can start to work on fix for this issue to make our system more resilient than before. And uh, Jacob, would you like to talk about the use cases of chaos engineering? In Absolutely, my favorite. So I touched on this a little earlier um, while we were running the experiment, but you know we have all of these tools, and you know we're, we're, we've and a lot of companies spend a lot of time and frankly a lot of money, you know, on observability and monitoring tools. But the missing piece is how do I validate? What that, what that, what we're doing in that perspective? Because if you know, I'm relying on that observability tool to alert me, and then in some, in some, you know, large, not large scales, but in some cases, wake me up because something's wrong. So let's start with something small like CPU spikes on my service to simulate runaway processes, and then in the cloud, does that tie into your to auto scaling um, services being a reachable? I, I mentioned. Um, slow responses on uh, a database, um, or even just notifications for incidents and uh, and memory. In regards to your, uh, especially with monitoring agents, those become really interesting because now you're kind of flying blind. So what's the result of that? Um, dependency failure is a big one, um, especially for, I touched on this earlier in the presentation around um, the things that we aren't in control of, but that we're relying on, especially uh, third-party dependencies. So you want to understand what happens from that perspective and then do we have a fallback plan or any sort of redundancy? Uh, similarly with DNS or uh, load balancer failures. If this node goes, is, you know, out of service, my load balancer shouldn't be sending traffic to it, right? So that's how, you know, someone to validate that. 
Um, non-critical services, validating those are super important, um, especially if a non-critical service actually causes a critical service to, to go down. Um, and then um, third-party uh, SaaS and API latency is a really, really good one to start with too. And then my personal favorite around incident response plans, um, recreating a past incident to compare your team's recovery time. Um, at Fanatics, we had an incident on our payment service where um, PayPal, uh, PayPal's API went down. And so we were, at the time, no big deal. Um, you know, our customers can take Visa or MasterCards and, and we're, you know, we're not impacted. But that wasn't true. Uh, we ended up seeing a bunch of errors on, uh, on the payment service. And once we dug in, we realized that the PayPal uh, API or the, the, the essential um, critical was actually in our critical path. And what ended up happening is it caused everything to fail. So we had to take that out. But if we did an experiment ahead of time and were more proactive, we would have seen that, that issue coming. And then that ties into uh, things like incident playbooks around simulated scenarios and on-call training. Um, and then latency between database replicas is a big one too. So all in all, from a chaos engineering perspective, um, and you know, Gremlin is used um, and we mentioned this earlier, all over the map from uh, company to company, retail, financial services, high tech, media. So we're helping a lot of companies build more um, reliable systems um, every day, um, especially uh, a lot of folks doing things like fire drills for incident training, as I mentioned. So uh, lastly, as we kind of close things out, um, and Kelly mentioned our site channel, but we actually have a uh, a overall community community website that one has the ability to get to the, our Slack channel, as well as a bunch of blogs and tutorials um, about uh, different sort of use cases. So you can check those out um, as well. And we actually have a forever free version of Gremlin that you can use for CPU uh, shutdown and black hole attacks. We did a black hole attack uh, today. So you can head over there, gremlin.com slash free and take a look at that. And then lastly, on my side, um, we just announced our um, third annual Chaos Conf. Um, it'll be the largest Chaos Engineering Conference in history, um, October 6th through the 8th. Um, it's going to be all virtual. Um, super, super excited to get that uh, up and running. It's actually my birthday weekend. So super, super stoked to get a, a conference for my birthday. All right, so on the Terrazzo side, as a software consultancy, Terrazzo can advise and implement a chaos engineering and observability practice for your organization, ensuring that your API platform strategy for or application modernization strategy are stress tests to meet increased demands, giving you an unfair advantage. And uh, before I end this, I also wanted to give a big shout out to my teammates, uh, Wyatt and Adam. We all work on this demo, to, demo apps together. And also thanks uh, Chris and Randy for their help in uh, the the webinar. All right, um, I think that's it for the presentation. Thank you both, gentlemen. That was awesome. Hope everybody learned uh, something today and how you can kind of apply these principles to your, uh, to your own business and kind of stress test your systems uh, to ensure better outcomes. Um, with that, I want to pass things over to uh, Randy Franklin, who's going to um, facilitate our Q&A. Uh, so, like I said, feel free to write in the comments or use the raise hand feature. And um, Randy, I think we have our first question in the in the chat. Uh, do you want me to read it or you, or you have that pulled up? Oh, it's okay. I can take it. Thank you, Trevor. Um, and thank you, thank Ben you. and Jacob, for that presentation. That was great. You know, it, it's funny. Um, in, in a couple decades of IT work, I can definitely say that just about every post-incident review and root cause analysis I've ever done, it, done has always started out with the same statement. Well, we never thought this would happen, you know, and uh, it's just it's just rung true to me that you will always be surprised and a key facet of engineering and designing resilient systems starts with that pre-mortem mentality of trying to understand, OK, how could this fail? Um, and that's what, um, you know, tools like Gremlin and other observability site reliability engineering practices are are meant to try and uncover. So I'll read the first question here, and this is for Jacob at Gremlin over here. So you mentioned chaos engineering game days. Can you go into a bit more detail on how those are structured and who from an organization would participate? 
Is it more for people who are already heading down the path of chaos engineering? Or are there ways to use game days to introduce the concept to teams who may be unfamiliar with it? Phenomenal question. Thank you, Chris. So um, there's, so I'll kind of answer it in kind of bite-sized pieces. So um, as far as how they're typically structured, so um, and how we recommend it at, uh, at Gremlin is typically four roles. One is uh, what we kind of call the chaos sort of general. That's the person that is in charge of, you know, sort of owning the overall exercise, you know, responsible for the feedback, finalizing the, you know, the tests and um, things like that. The person essentially pushing the, 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 the attack button, so to speak, uh, or uh, what we call the chaos commander. So they're the one implementing and executing those experiments. Um, and then the last two are the chaos scribe, which can simply be put together as essentially the person taking the notes and um, working with the last person, uh, which is the chaos observer. So that's the person that is in uh, Datadog or Grafana or in the UI or load testing to validate, um, you know, the different pieces that, you know, that you're trying to experiment and then giving that feedback to the scribe as well as the rest of the folks. Um, now, from a company perspective, um, I, I jokingly say everyone. Um, and what I mean by that is I've seen it all over the gamut because um, I found it super valuable. And, and this kind of ties into the last portion of the question around introduction to chaos engineering. Game days is a phenomenal place to start. Um, and it's very common, actually. Um, sometimes it zooms into one specific experiment. We touched on, you know, postmortems. So like, let's just reintroduce a pain point that we've experienced and see how we got better at it. Like that's super valuable. Um, and, and then if we zoom out a bit and do two or three, guess what? You've done a game day. So, um, so that's, it's kind of all over the place. It typically starts at, you know, if we're looking at a particular service, who owns the service, who's responsible for the service. And then that typically ties into who's responsible for it from a business or executive level. Um, one of my favorite game days I've ever um, been a part of the actual cast commander, the person pushing the button, if you will, was the VP of e-commerce because he wanted to understand how his, because he didn't really understand what was happening at the engineering level. And what was amazing was you could see the conversations happening for the very first time there as well. Like, you know, and then that kind of built this really cool kind of camaraderie. And then he can go to the CTO and say, this is why we need to invest our time in doing this because I literally saw our team get better. Hope that answers it all. Nice. Thank you, Jacob. You know, as I was listening to you talk, one of the things that came to my mind was you mentioned that postmortem mentality of understanding how we've seen um, infrastructures or systems um, come under undue stress mm -hmm. and then the ability to retest that as we move forward. And, you know, some, some information that came out of ThoughtWorks is this notion of evolutionary architectures and the idea of applying fitness tests to ensure that and to ensure that you're maintaining um, certain aspects of an architecture as you evolve it moving forward. And this type of, you know, prescribed and safe stress testing of an application architecture is a good way to ensure that you're holding true to those fitness functions as you continue to evolve an application architecture, maybe from a premise base to a public cloud, or maybe yep. you're in a hybrid type configuration, or maybe even multi-cloud. Yep. And as you have so many different moving parts, it's awfully hard to remember all of the things that you've uh, you know, uncovered in the past that you hope your solutions carry forward with you as you continue to evolve those application architectures. So yes. de definitely a good question. Very good question. Super, super good question. I have a funny story, a small story about that. I was at, this was right after I just joined the cloud engineering team at Fanatics and we had uh, just moved essentially all of our front end uh, to, to AWS from, from on, from on premise. And so, uh, but of course our fulfillment centers were still on, on, on prem. And, um, I remember asking, okay, well, what's connecting that? And they were like, it's a direct, uh, AWS direct connect. And literally the next thing out of my mouth was, okay, well, what happens when it goes down? And everyone was just like, it never goes down. <laughs> and I was just like, how do we not like, I, I like literally I could, I got to be honest. I was just like, how do we not? How do we not have an answer to that? Like we gotta have an answer to that because if our front end can't talk, it's because essentially when you zoom out, it means our front end can't talk to our back end. <laughs> that means no no packages are getting shipped. That means <laughs> no one can check out. That mean or not check out. No one can get past the shipping the order confirmation page. Like it it 
blow it like you know how, how, how are we not asking ourselves these questions and I'm the most junior guy on the team so yep no doubt okay well it, any other questions from anyone on the on the uh, webinar we'd certainly welcome the, the opportunity to answer some questions and you know give a little bit of insight as well to where we can help yeah absolutely and you know and then if one pops in you know, an hour later, you know, feel free to hit us up in, in Slack as well. Absolutely. Hey, Randy, this is Nick Critch. Um, may I jump in? Yes, please. Just, uh, just out of morbid interest, um, because uh, a lot of this is done using production environments, and of course, uh, we want to reduce the blast zone and be careful about the, the, the testing the, the uh, or planning the tests and um, the implications of the testing. I'm just curious if there have been any war stories of uh, just some of the unintended consequences that may have been observed past. Yeah, definitely. So like a, an unintended consequence of running a test that was intended to, uh, intended to create no harm. Is that, is that what you're asking? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think Jacob, Jacob may have one or two. Um, yeah, I'm sure Jacob. I have many, many war stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, so yeah, so one that comes to mind is right before I actually even learned about like chaos engineering as a concept, because Many folks have heard of disaster recovery testing for forever, right? For eons almost, right? So, um, so we essentially we were doing a high scale, um, you know, sort of auto scaling test, and we essentially, we, but what we what we realized, what uh, very way too late in the game was actually let me back up. So we ran the test and everything went well in staging, and we felt confident going into Cyber Monday. This is actually incident. I was on call for Cyber Monday 2017, and I still have a shirt. I survived Cyber Monday. Um, and everything went great. We were testing out um, essentially I.O. And when Cyber Monday hit, we, we fell over. So we hit and broke those, essentially, let's say for simplicity, broke those ceilings. And uh, our console cluster, which you're going to with console, is what we use for service discovery. So this all essentially means that none of our services can talk to each other. So boom. Uh, so we were down for an hour. That was about an $11 million outage for one hour. It was, as you can imagine, terrifying. Um, so the postmortem coming out of that was, well, we were like, well, everything worked great in staging. What, what, what happened? What we found out was our, our underlying volumes were the wrong size. They were um, smaller in um, production than they were in staging which completely invalidates the test completely because, which essentially to touch on your point about prod, this is why it's so important to, even though I don't recommend starting in prod, but you need to, you need to build a strategy to get there because we, because we didn't do it. We, 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 I mean, to be frank, we lost $11 million. Like, and that's as high, high stakes as it gets. If that, if that answers that, uh, that question for you. Yes, thanks. I figured there were probably some interesting stories out there. Oh yeah, that's just one. <laughs> There's many. <laughs> I could write a book, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Any any other questions from anyone on the webinar? Yeah. No matter how silly. Okay. Well, Trevor, do you want to take us home? Yeah. Thanks so much, Randy, and thanks to everybody for your uh, for your questions. I uh, hope somebody, I hope everybody learned something today. And like I said, we'll uh, post a recap on our YouTube page tomorrow and have this available for uh, for download. And we'll email out the link as well. And uh, we will have uh, another um, webinar coming up here in July or August. We'll have more details shortly. But we are trying to make this a uh, monthly series. So we hope to see you back for another on the topic here soon that should be um, relevant and of interest. So appreciate everybody coming. Uh, have a great day and we hope to uh, see you again soon. Take care, everybody. Thank Thanks. Thanks.